Hi everyone, welcome to our Aconcagua webinar. My name is Mary Brown. I'm the guide manager here at Alpine Ascent. I primarily work with the scheduling and administration of our around 80 plus guide staff. Um, I'm pretty behind the scenes, but you might work with me if you're planning a private trip or have a special guide request. Today we'll be joined by Rachel Molstad and Sierra Sampaio. Rachel Molstad is one of our lead Aconcagua guides, and she'll be guiding two normal route expeditions this year. Although she originally hails from Oregon, she's been living in La Paz, Bolivia since around 2013, guiding in the Cordillera Real of the Andes. She's also the mastermind behind our wildly popular Great Peaks of Bolivia expedition, which she overhauled several years ago and typically leads around one or two of those a year, usually around mid-May to mid-June. Rachel still migrates up to the Pacific Northwest every year. You can usually catch her guiding on the Glaciated Peaks in Washington. And if you're really lucky, sometimes up on Denali. We'll also be joined by Sierra, who is our gear manager at Alpine Ascent. She's responsible for everything that goes into the outfitting of our climbs, courses, and expeditions. From revamping our gourmet climb menus to making sure we have enough equipment in our Seattle headquarters to outfit all of our climbs and programs, she truly does it all. She grew up in the Pacific Northwest as well and has a deep love for both mountains and traveling. Our game plan for the webinar today, we'll start with Rachel, who will give a detailed overview of the route and what to expect on your climb. Then Sierra will take it over and we'll dive into the gear and logistics of your expedition including information on porters. That's a big question people have. Last but not least, we'll open it up for a comprehensive question and answer session. So during the webinar, please be sure to put your questions in the question and answer box and we'll circle back and cover them at the end of the webinar. Periodically throughout the webinar, I'll also be popping links and other helpful information in the chat button or the chat box. Um, but now I'll move it over and Rachel can take the stage. Just one moment. All right, Rachel. All right, I think we're good to go. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, it's good to be with you here today to share a little bit more about the Aconcagua expedition logistics and itinerary. So um, should be seeing my screen now, I think with a um, picture of Aconcagua taken with a viewpoint from the Plaza de Mulas camp. And with that, we'll just dive right in. Uh, Aconcagua has an elevation of 22,841 feet. It's the highest peak in South America. So that also makes it one of the seven summits. And it's the highest mountain outside of Asia. So it's a really worthy endeavor that you're embarking upon here. Let's even get my screen to change. There we go. Days one and two of your itinerary uh, cover travel and your arrival in Mendoza. So you're scheduled to arrive either before or up to the morning of day two of your itinerary. Our first meeting as a group will be a gear check and orientation. So about a month before, more or less, before the beginning of your expedition, the lead guide will send out an email to the entire group. And your lead guide will be the one to let you know exactly the time of day and the place where that meeting will be, take, will be held. Um, it's usually two or three in the afternoon, one of the meeting rooms in the Hyatt Hotel, which is the hotel we'll be staying at the night before we move into the mountains to start our expedition. We'll take a couple of hours there to go through all the pieces of gear uh, that we should have brought for the expedition. I'd really recommend going very carefully through that gear list that is on the website and that you've received. Make sure you bring every item on there. It's uh, There are some items that are pretty much impossible to source in Mendoza, things like full zip puffy pants, uh, comfortable double uh, high altitude mountaineering boots, those kind of things. Uh, we really, really need to make sure we've got the right gear before we get to Mendoza. Other pieces uh, we've been able to source locally there, but they're usually very expensive. Uh, and not very good quality. So I'd really recommend going through the gear list. And then um, the office, the gear department at Alpine Sense is always there to help you figure out any questions that come up as you're working through that process. Um, so we'll work on gear in the afternoon there, and then we'll go out to eat together as a team. Uh, you can see a picture there in the corner of one of our meals from a couple of years ago, the food in Mendoza. 
is really delicious. So we'll pack in some calories before we move up to the mountains. Um, also that day, as we're sorting out our gear, we'll begin the process of separating out our luggage. We're gonna have basically four different uh, pieces of luggage that we need to separate as we move on to the mountain. The first one of those will be a bag that we'll leave at the there are, suppose you brought extra travel clothes, you brought things like a laptop, things that do not need to move up to the mountains. We'll leave those at the Hyatt and then we'll separate out. Uh, you can see folks in the corner down there carrying their duffels onto a bus. We'll sort out what we need to go in the duffels and those will be carried by mules as we begin our expedition as we are trekking in. Um, we'll separate out a trekking pack uh, and then separate things for our last night before we move on to the mountain. So I'll give you a little bit more information on that as we go ahead, but just a little heads up. So day three on the itinerary, we will move from Mendoza. Let me move this little piece here. Whoop. Mendoza down in the corner of the city, you can follow this uh, red line is the path that we'll take in the vehicle up to Penitentes. We'll make a stop in the middle there for lunch in a place called Uspayata. Drive time is about three and a half hours, and we will spend one final night uh, outside the park, a uh, place where we have actual hotel showers and uh, a little bit more luxury before we get into the mountains. So where that red dot there is. And then you can see actually the routes on the mountain traced in smaller red and blue there. We're gonna zoom in on that piece in a minute here. Um, so one of the kind of confusing things as we start off this expedition is where the luggage goes. So. We left some in Mendoza, what well, we don't want to take up to the mountains. And then on this day that we travel up to the mountains uh, and, or sorry, up to our hotel before we go into the mountains, we will drop off our duffels, uh, which will be carried by mules all the way up to our basically established base camp before we move into uh, trekking higher up on the mountain. The mules will be going with us every day. So we'll leave those duffels that day. And then every evening we'll have access to those duffels again, but we'll separate that stuff out. That sounds really confusing. So on the website, there is a tab that goes through the details of that logistics for our, our luggage. You can look through before we arrive in Mendoza and it kind of helps you have an idea of how things are gonna go. If you go to the gear list uh, portion of the website and then click on the overview here has the actual gear list beside it where it says luggage log logistics is a tab that explains all those pieces in depth what I was referencing there. Day four, of our itinerary, whether you're on the normal route or the Vacus route, will be the day that we start trekking into the mountains. We actually get up into Aconcagua National Park. The red line here is the Vacus route. The, sorry, the blue line is the Vacus route and the red line is the normal route. We have one, two, three days of trekking to reach our base camp where we will be for several nights on the Vacus route. So each of these points here, we advance one point, then camp, advance up to the next point, camp, and then one more third day up to the point and then camp. So this entire area here that we're advancing, the mules will carry our duffels. We'll be advancing with trekking, pack, trekking packs. And then each of these nights, we will make a tent camp before we get up to our base camp here at Plaza Argentina. So I'll start by going through the uh, Bacchus Valley route and then we'll come back around to the normal route. One more side, there we go. This is a breakdown of how that trek for three days into Plaza Argentina looks like. You can see in the photo here, uh, this is the crossing, we crossed the river on the morning of our third day going out to Plaza Argentina. And uh, usually we can work with the uh, mule drivers who's been kind of with us, we can cross over on one of their mules is, is one of the fun little experiences on Aconcagua. So that's what that picture is. And then we'll arrive at Plaza Argentina where we will spend uh, four nights. So this is a point of luxury on the mountain for us. You can see uh, this bigger picture here is folks coming back down from the first camp above Plaza Argentina. And so you can see the little city of base camp tents down here. And the, the smaller picture is what the inside of one of those looks like. So we will have tables, chairs, uh, all the eating utensils, and then also access to showers, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi, although I will say it is spotty. I um, don't count on it being very good Wi-Fi, but we'll have potential there. Uh, and then also we have a team of staff there who is cooking meals for us. So definitely a point to refresh and regroup and acclimate as we begin preparing to move further up the mountain. 
So we trekked in up the mountain. We arrived at this point right here. If you can see my cursor circling is Plaza Argentina. From there, we will take a rest day. Right after we arrive, the next day is a rest day. And then we'll begin starting to carry supplies further up the mountain over here. We have one, two, three high camps on the upper mountain. And we will make a system of carry supplies, rest day, move up as we progress through these camps and acclimate. Um, so we'll have a rest day here. And then usually the next day after that, we'll carry up supplies from this point here. The mules do not go any further up the mountain. We are responsible for on the Vacas route, carrying up the entirety of the rest of our supplies. So that means our tents, our uh, fuel for cooking, our food supplies, plus all of our personal gear, sleeping bags, sleeping mats, all those things will come up the mountain with us. And so when we take our carry days, we take part of that stuff that we don't need for that day, extra food for camps further up, say, and we'll pull that up the mountain. And then when we have our move date, we'll pull up the rest of the supplies with us. Um, that process is a variable amount of days, depending on the weather that we're hitting. We'll try and move ourselves up the mountain in advance to usually this camp here, uh, Camp Two or Camp Guanacos is a great place for us to stage and wait for a good weather window to move our way up to the last camp and to our summit attempt day. Um, but the first camp here, known as just called Camp One, 16,300 feet. And then we'll move up Camp Two, Guanacos is 18.2. And then Cholera, here's our last camp, 19.6. And these are what a lot of our days will look like. Moving our way up um, the mountain slowly, carrying up our gear, some really nice views. However many days we'll be on the upper mountain, exactly the schedule as we move between those camps will be weather dependent. And then we get to our summit attempt day. Uh, this point here is cholera, our last camp before we are able to make our summit attempt. Summit attempt a day usually involves about eight to nine hours of travel uphill and then about four to five hours down. So that's 12 to 14 hour day. Uh, we been, begin just below 20,000. Points to note on the route uh, that you may have heard of as you're writing descriptions. We have uh, this point here is called Independencia. It's 21,000 feet. So by the time you go up this high, you've gone about 1,400 feet up. From there, we'll go across an area called the Door to the Wind, where oftentimes we, we hit some, some different weather and further wind on the mountain. And we will move our way across here. This is the Traverse. If you've heard of the cave, this area here is the cave, and that's 22,000 feet. As we get further and further up, we move slower and slower as the altitude gets more and more difficult to deal with. Um, about 400, 500 feet up, we'll get to the top of this uh, chute here called the Canaleta, and then walk across the final few hundred feet up to the summit itself. And then hopefully with some luck, we can get up to this picture here is the summit plateau, uh, variable, types of weather we might hit up there, but um, that would be hopefully goal we can get to. And then, so since the Vacas Valley route, we came up this side here in the blue. This was Plaza Argentina right here. And then we moved our way up the upper mountain. This is the route up to the summit. The day after summit, so we will come back down to the cholera camp after our summit day. We'll take one day to move down to this side of the mountain here, which is Plaza Mulas, which is the base camp for the normal route. And then the next day we will hike our way all the way out this red line here and back down and exit the park. So now for the normal route, um, actually let me go back here one, one page. The normal route is this red line. This is where we enter the park down here. So our day four on the itinerary is the day we enter the park. The first day is hiking up to this point right here, which is Confluencia where we have a sort of small city with those tents again, where we can have tables and chairs and all the amenities. Uh, and then we'll spend two nights at this camp here, Confluencia. We'll take one day to hike up to Plaza Francia, which is this other valley here. It's an overlook where we get a view of the south face of Aconcagua, which is a 9,000 foot wall of ice and rock and one of the world's great uh, mountaineering faces. So it's really, really fun way to acclimate and get views at the same time. We'll spend our second night at Confluencia, and then we will hike all the way up this distance here to Plaza de Mulas. A little breakdown of how that looks. And this is a view hiking up um, from 
the all the way up into we'll get up into plus Mulas on this day. And then we reach Plas Mulas. As you can see from this picture, that Plas Mulas is a much larger, even uh, oasis of, of more luxury on the mountain for us. And we will have once again here, we will have access to showers, Wi Fi, tables, chairs, um, a whole team cooking really. They do a really good job, really great meals for us up there. We are scheduled to spend five nights um, at Pasling Willis on the normal route itinerary. We will take a rest day immediately after we arrive. And then one of the days uh, after that we're up there, we'll have a hike up to Cerro Bonete. We get to above almost 17,000 feet. That's the view from our hike up there. Really great way to acclimate and once again, get some views in. And then we'll begin the process of working our way on up the upper mountain on the normal route side, this side here in the red. Um, once again, we have the three upper mountain camps. We will take one day from Plas Willis, one of the days that we're still there, we will carry up to the first camp, which is Canada, about 16-1. Um, that day we will share in carrying the group food loads, usually just group food loads, about uh, 25 pounds, up to this camp. All the moves up the rest of the camps on the normal route, we have porter support included for the group gear, which would be the, so the tents, the group food, our fuel for cooking, those kind of things. That porter support is included in our movement on the route on this side. We are responsible for carrying our own personal gear up the mountain. So our, our first camp here is Canada. The day that we move up to Canada, 16-1, we will spend one night here. And then the next camp is Nido, which is our camp two. And that's about 18.3. We will spend uh, at least two nights at Nido, maybe more, depending on the weather. This is a great place to stage and wait to move up to our last camp for a summit attempt day. Um, and so then after that, we'll move up to Cholera, 19.6. And then we're in position again for that same summit route from there. And no matter what, uh, no matter what, we will be spending a rest day though, definitely in Nido. We'll delay on my page turns, there we go. So this is a photo from our last camp on the mountain, cholera, about 19.6 here. And um, once again, I don't know exactly how many days we'll spend on the upper mountain, depending on the weather and when we can move, where and when. So days 11 to 16 or 18-ish, uh, depending on what we could do. The mountain decides. And then once we've had our summit attempt day, we will take one day to come down from Cholera back to Plaza Mulas. And then the next day we'll hike all the way back out to the park entrance again. So before I pass the uh, screen over to Sierra, I just wanted to add in one other little piece uh, tips for exhibition success on Aconcagua. Just things to keep in mind. Uh, oftentimes when we start an exhibition like this, you kind of forget how many days it is up on the mountain. And I just want to encourage you all to, as you embark on your exhibition, enjoy the journey of the day to day to day, traveling up the mountain. Um, make sure you prepare for being up there for a lot of days with not very good connectivity to internet or communication with the outside world. It's a harsh environment. We have a uh, it's often cold. It's definitely pretty much always very, very dry air, often very windy. Uh, we'll be struggling with the altitude, struggling to acclimate, struggling to breathe. That's all uncomfortable. Um, so make sure that you're, you're mentally ready for this is going to be a challenge. Uh, and then also paying attention to how you're taking care of yourself up there. Um, a mountain like Aconcagua, all the little details add up. If you start getting behind on hydrating from the beginning of the trip, then you get behind on your acclim acclimatization. Um, the sunscreen, you start to get your face burned. It's hard for it to heal in that environment. Keeping your nutrition and strength up and energy up for the entire length of the expedition. All those little pieces are, are, are so very important. So, um, and then just really, really stressing that, enjoying the day to day of it. And, and this is what my task is for today. We're gonna walk this distance. We're gonna do this um, and taking it piece by piece. And uh, hopefully those tips can help you kind of um, prepare for your expedition. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and pass over to Sierra. There we go. Thanks so much, Rachel. Thanks for that great overview. 
Awesome. Uh, I'm going to talk about just a couple of things to help hopefully make your expedition as smooth as possible. Let me just share my screen now. One second. Okay. Let's see that. All right. Is that not full screen? <laughs> That's all right. We'll go with that. Okay. Let's talk about a couple of things that uh, you will need to enter Argentina and also participate in the climb. Um, COVID, there is no longer any COVID um, testing or vaccination to enter Argentina, but you will need to bring your vaccination card as well as two antigen test kits on the expedition. You also will have to complete a declaration uh, 48 hours within your departure to Argentina. Um, you'll be asked to provide evidence for travel medical insurance that shows that it has coverage for COVID uh, and a COVID vaccination certificate if that's applicable to you. Couple things on packing. As Rachel said, the high altitude boots, double boots, and the full zip insulated pants uh, are really hard to source in Argentina. Um, so we recommend that you pack those in your carry-on luggage just to avoid anything, uh, any missed baggage. You know, you can replace a lot of those things there, but those two things you wanna make sure that you have. Um, so the other part of that is checking your baggage tags. Um, when you check your bags at the airport, and checking to see if you need to pick up your baggage uh, during your connecting flight. Maybe that's in Buenos Aires or Santiago, um, but typically you'll need to grab your bags and take them through customs and immigration. Um, so make sure you do that so you have all of your bags and all of your gear by the time you get to Mendoza. Um, porters and packs. On the normal route, like Rachel mentioned, um, the porters are carrying the group gear for most of the time. Um, but if you want the porters to carry your personal gear, uh, they can do that up to about, uh, let's see, what is it? 24 to 44 pounds of your personal gear. Um, if you choose to hire the porters, then your pack weight would be about 15 to 20 pounds. Um, and if you do hire the porters, uh, if you don't hire the porters, they'll be about 35 to 40 pounds. Uh, the normal route, the cost, if you use porters for each leg that you can, the total cost would be uh, $13.50. Each of these legs uh, is broken up. It's about $200 to $350 per, per carry uh, for the normal route. And on the vacas, it's more like $300 to $500 per leg. So you can choose if you want to do a couple of carries or all of them. Uh, but the cost here, well, I did not put the Right, total cost on there. I think it's 27. <laughs> Sorry, the, max, uh, the cost for the vacas is 27.90 for if you do all of the carries there. Uh, and we recommend that you pre-book the porters through Alpine Ascents so that you can avoid paying the 5% local credit card fee uh, and avoid carrying extra cash. So. And speaking of cash, we can talk about how much cash you should bring to the mountain. Um, US dollars are the preferred currency in Argentina. Uh, you'll get a much better exchange rate and you should really make sure that you bring new crisp $100 bills um, in, in order to exchange the money. You should bring about $2,000 cash uh, to the mountain with you for tips, permits, services at base camp. There are lots of things that you can purchase at base camp like showers, Wi-Fi, snacks, and drinks. Uh, they do accept credit cards up there, but they don't work very well and sometimes not at all. So you should not rely on those and you should just bring the cash. Um, also make sure that you have cash for tips, um, tips for the mealers and also tips for the guides. Uh, we have some recommended amounts here and they are all shared equally by all the guides on the team. Uh, and it's, it's also important um, to, try and tip your local guides in cash and not use um, some of these money transfer apps um, because the exchange rate ends up being really, really poor. And so they end up getting like maybe half of uh, the intended amount. So cash. <laughs> um, food. Uh, Rachel touched on a little bit about some of the food that you'll be eating. Um, lower on the mountain, 
<laughs> lower on the mountain, uh, you'll be eating heavier things like burgers and pasta, quesadillas. Um, and then higher on the mountain, it'll be things like pastas, um, maybe rice, ramen, soups, things like that. Um, breakfasts lower on the mountain are delicious French toast, grilled boudin. It's kind of like a coffee cake, um, eggs, and then up higher, more like oatmeal and cereal. Um, but you will need to bring some supplemental food. Uh, Alpine includes some lunch food, especially lower, uh, things like meats and cheeses, uh, crackers, cookies, uh, but you'll want to supplement for the higher, um, for the higher mountain and make sure that it's food that you like. Make sure it's food that you can eat if it gets frozen. Um, rock hard, <laughs> rock hard things might not be very pleasant. Um, and also, if you're bringing food from the States, make sure you leave the food in its original packaging so that uh, you can take it through customs, in particular, any meat products uh, like jerky or anything like that. Uh, if you don't eat meat or cheese or anything like that, then you should bring extra supplemental food um, to supplement for those things. And also please make sure that uh, your dietary info is on file with us so that we can make sure to accommodate uh, any dietary restrictions or allergies that you might have. Um, this is just a little bit about some of the foods that you can bring for those supplemental uh, foods, things like electrolyte mix, energy gels and chews, uh, energy bars. Uh, the amounts to bring are pretty similar between the normal route and the vacas route, just a little bit extra on the vacas. And that is all I have for you. All right, now it's time for some questions. So hopefully you've been popping questions in the Q&A box. Um, let's see where to start. Let's see, on the Vacas route, about how much group gear should we expect to carry above base camp? Uh, I think, Sierra, you touched on that earlier, but would you mind um, letting us know about how much group gear? That is an excellent question that um, Rachel, do you want to take that one? Yeah, it's, it's an amount that's going to vary based on which camp we're moving to, but you can expect your pack to weigh about 50 pounds for each of our carry and move days, somewhere between um, 40 to 50. So that might be our first moves a little bit more food, a little bit more fuel. Um, it'll change day to day. And then your upper camps, the weight could go down a bit. We'll have less food, less fuel to move at that point. So, but I expect 40 to 50 pounds for our move and carry days. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay. What do we have next? Would you recommend a negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit sleeping bag or negative 40 degrees? The gear list mentions both, but I'm curious what conditions may call for one over the other. I imagine negative 40 degree would be quite warm at lower elevation. Uh, Rachel, Sierra, who wants to take that one? I can take that one. I will unmute myself this time. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, if you are someone who sleeps cold, then you might want a negative 40 degree bag. We recommend a negative 20 and that works for the majority of people, but you know, some people sleep warmer than others and some people sleep colder. So if you know that you're someone who sleeps a little bit colder, then you might think about, you know, bringing a slightly warmer sleeping bag or bumping up your sleeping pad R value or something like that. I should add in so that it's clear on my previous answer about the pack weight. When I said 40 to 50, that's your group gear combined with your personal gear, how that's going to divide out. Just so that's, it's not 40, 50 of group gear. <laughs> All right. What do we have next? Um, do we need to exchange any U.S. dollars? Sierra, do you want, do you want to take that one? Sure. Unmute myself. Um, you will want a little bit of pesos, but when you're on the mountain, then U.S. dollars are king and you can pay for everything in U.S. dollars. So you don't need to bring a big stack of pesos to the mountain, um, but you know, in town and things like that, you might want some of those, but mostly on the mountain, you can use U.S. dollars. 
And you can change money. Um, there's a place right near the hotel to change money too. So if you want to change a little bit and see how much more you need and then change a little bit more because once you have pesos, they really almost don't even want to change them back to dollars for you. <laughs> they kind of become worthless. So you avoid too much. All right, what's next? Will Alpine be handling our food for the expedition? Will that food and those cooking items be part of group gear that will be divided up? Or will Alpine porters be taking care of that? Rachel, do you want to take that one? Uh, okay, I was trying to understand. <laughs> I think I understand. So. Um, if you are on the Macus route, um, so all so as far as packing the food, all the food will be packed for you definitely either route wherever you're at, um, as far as our group food, besides the snacks that you're gonna bring apart from that. But as far as hauling it, moving it um, from Plaza Argentina up on the Vacas route, we are moving all of that food ourselves. That's part of our group gear. Um, on the normal route, if you're coming up the normal route side from Plaza de Mulas upwards, um, in that case, we do have porter support built in for moving all that group food um, through porters. It does not go into our backpacks. So that's one of the differences between the Vacus and the normal route. Next. Let's see. There was a question about training, something about training on an incline. What I'm going to do for that one is pop our training recommendations just in the chat for everyone to take a look at. Um, it, the training recommendations um, are pretty comprehensive, so the best way to get a really good idea about the training for the trip and if you're training at the right amount is to read those closely. And if you have any questions, call us at the office for those. What's next? Um, Rachel, can you say a little bit more about the nature of the route from Camp 1 to Camp 3? Switchbacks, scree, how much snow in December, um, and how much of that can be done in regular hiking boots versus double boots? Yeah, good question. Yeah, so uh, on Aconcagua, we will become scree masters. <laughs> we'll be walking on a lot of scree. Uh, and we will, whenever possible, especially at the higher, higher elevations, take as many switchbacks as possible so that we're moving up in elevation slowly um, at higher altitudes. So lots of screen, uh, but sometimes it snows, uh, sometimes it melts off quickly, sometimes it stays around. Variable, there could be snow underfoot between those camps. Um, that'll change throughout the season and then season to season. But we will be doing those moves between camp one, two, three, up to the summit, all that will be in double boots more because of the temperature and also the grip on the scree surface. We have um, quite a few areas where it's that kind of hard packed or frozen dirt with pebblies on top of it. And our double boots are really good at uh, moving on that terrain. Thanks. I have a couple questions about phones, cell phones, fat phones. Um, one question is, on the normal route, uh, are there any points where people can use their cell phones? Cell service on the normal route? There, there is no cell service on the normal route. Or the or the Vacas route, either of them. Once we're inside the park, there's no cell service. Got it. Um, are people able to take their personal rental light? personal rental satellite phones with them on expeditions. Dear, you wanna take this one? Um, yeah, yeah, you're welcome to bring uh, your personal satellite phone or um, inReach or anything like that you'd like. Yeah. One more question for Sierra, are negative 40 degree bags available for rental? Yes, they are. And uh, when you put in your gear rental, uh, just put in the notes that you would rather have a negative 40 degree bag. Next. This next question is for Rachel. Will I be able to leave some items at base camp that are not needed for hire up on the mountain? Definitely, good question. Yeah, I didn't mention that. Um, so yeah, whenever we leave from Plaza Argentina or Plaza de Mulas, we will leave our duffels there with any of the extra kit that we brought that we do not need for the upper mountain portion of the trip. Um, so definitely can leave stuff there. And then um, 
I also didn't mention this, but this might be part of that question as well. When we leave our things at Plaza Argentina and you're on the Bacchus route, you'll notice we do a 360 around the mountain so we don't come back to that side. But when we make our move to go up to the summit, we will then let that camp know that they can send our stuff around the mountain so our duffel will come around the mountain and meet us at Plaza Mulas. So we can then pack our duffel again and the mules will take it back out the park on the opposite side. So we can definitely either side we're reclining, we can leave stuff at the base camps. Now we have two questions about boots. Question number one, are the La Sportiva G2SM boots appropriate for Aconcagua? Affirmative. <laughs> Question number two, uh, it looks like there were some 8,000 meter boots in the photos. Uh, do you recommend uh, 8,000 meter boots, pros or cons? What are your thoughts? Rachel, do you want to take that one? Okay, sorry, I thought Sierra was trying to answer what's needed. Um, I, <laughs> I think 6,000 meter boots are totally adequate for Aconcagua. I think that's a good choice. Um, sometimes it is not super, super, super cold, but we are in double boots because we're on the scree and the double boots really grip better on that scree. If you have an 8,000 meter boot, sometimes that's a little bit warm. So I think I think 6,000 meter boots are pretty good fit for Aconcagua. Um, I would recommend with the boots though, there are some versions of 6,000 meter boots that have come out in the past couple of years that have this orange foamy sole on the bottom that makes them lighter weight. If you get a 6,000 meter boot with that kind of sole, it will get absolutely destroyed on Aconcagua on the scree since it's made for being on top of snow and we're on top of scree, it just doesn't, it's not durable. So I would watch out for that with those boots. And especially if more and more of the 8,000 meter boots have those uh, kind of, a, it's a lighter uh, sole material. So make sure you definitely don't want to climb up and cut with those soles though. Nice. Um, more questions on boots, very hot topic. Um, what are your thoughts on La Sportiva Barunse boots? Are we pro or against for Aconcagua? Yes, they work. Okay, good. <laughs> Affirmative. Um, another question about boots. Uh, do we have some preferred double boots you recommend? Uh, would um, Rachel, would you like to maybe list off um, some boot models that would be appropriate? Or maybe Sierra, take this one. Um, some boot models that would be appropriate for Aconcagua? Yeah, um, the La Sportiva G2SMs, like uh, we mentioned, and the La Sportiva Spantix would be another good option. Um, I wonder, I'm curious what Rachel uses actually herself. <laughs> I have an old pair of Scarpa uh, Phantom 6000s that are uh, pretty burly, and so they last well in La Concagua. I think that's a theme here, um, uh, one that has a a good durability is important for Aconcagua. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And um, one other thing, if you're looking for these boots, um, if you have more narrow feet, then you know you should stick maybe with the Las Sportivas. And if you don't have wider feet, Scarbas are known for having a wider toe box, so they might work better for you. Thanks. Let's see, a couple more gear questions. For down parkas, do we recommend down suits for Aconcagua or is down jackets good enough? Yeah, down jackets are gonna be good enough. Um, we will have temperature swings with, if the, the kind of the main factor in Aconcagua is sometimes that wind comes up and whips freezing cold. And um, that could, we want the ability to choose between taking off our parka, putting it back on, having that variability. If we're in a down suit, we're just, we're stuck in that layer and it's a, uh, not going to be adaptable throughout the day. So down parka is absolutely what we want. Great question. Um, up next, uh, also about boots, should we bring over boots? And uh, when, it, yeah, should, should you bring over boots? No, uh -uh. not on Aconcagua, no. No over boots. Let's see, um, next question. Oh, I'll actually take this one. Will Alpine Ascent post updates of expedition progress on its webpage? We will. So if you go to, on our website, Climbs Aconcagua, 
one of the options you'll see in a blue bar if you're on a desktop computer is Cybercast. And teams typically post Cybercast about once a day. Um, or if, yeah, usually once a day with updates about where they are, some highlights, and those typically are audio podcasts or Cybercast. Uh, yeah, so we will post updates. What other outstanding questions? Ah, this is a really good question. Um, what are our recommendations on Diamox? Okay, that's very easy. <laughs> um, so Diamox, we don't generally recommend taking it prophylactically, uh, but we do recommend uh, speaking with your doctor and getting a prescription for it so you can bring it with you. And that way we have it as a tool to use on the mountain should we choose to do so, should we choose to need it. Um, that's something that we will talk really in depth about altitude and diamox and all the interactions um, on the expedition, but I would definitely say bring it with you. I wouldn't uh, recommend starting off taking it and then we have it available for us as a tool kind of in, in some there. Nice, that was a great question. Let's see, what other questions? Let's see, oh, this one is about gear. Uh, Sierra, do you wanna take this one? Is the RAV Expedition 8,000 meter jacket too warm for Aconcagua? Sierra's on mute, but she gave it a thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, so that was a thumbs up for the RAV 8,000 meter expedition for Um Let's see. Oh, this one is a great one for Rachel. Um, can you clue us in on how it works with human waste yeah. on the upper mountain? Yeah, so um, Alpine Essence has built into the cost of the trip porters to take down our human waste, both human waste and the trash that we generate um, up on the upper mountain camps. So we will have a porter uh, load designated for each of our camps to move that down. We are not going to be um, individually responsible for taking down our human waste, which is really, really nice. Yeah. Thanks. That was a great question. Uh, we have a couple of questions coming in about porters. Uh, question number one, can you split a porter between two people? And the sort of along with that question, if you use a porter on the Bacchus Valley route, are you able to bring a smaller expedition backpack than we recommend, 50 to 60 liters? Uh, Sierra, do you wanna take those two questions? Unmute. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 I don't see why you wouldn't be able to split a porter between two people. I think. I think that's okay. As long as you're within the um, 11 to 20 kilograms, 24 to 44 pounds, um, then that should be fine. Um, and the other question was if they could bring smaller packs. Is there anywhere on the Vacas where they would need to carry everything or they would, I, I think, I think they could bring smaller slightly smaller packs a little bit smaller but not too much smaller the the thing is oftentimes on a day like a summit day for instance we'll often start out say wearing our i'll even a lot of days on summit day i'll start out wearing my puffy pants every single layer i have and then the day might turn out to be really nice and i need that capacity that space to be able to stuff in puffy pants and my parka and have a bunch of water and, and food and snacks in there so um for some days like that some capacity just for puff more than weight I think is still important, but I think they put their 50, 60 liters. I think that would still be fine. Thank you. Okay, that was a great question. Let's see. We won't have time to answer all the questions, but we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, circling back to human waste, uh, are we going to be using blue bags? So um, a bag with a blue inner bag or clean mountain cans? Um, Rachel, you want to take that one? Yeah, yeah. So uh, wherever we have uh, formal camps that are more base camps, like Confluencia, Plaza de Mulas, Plaza Argentina, those areas we actually have uh, toilet systems there. It's either a, like a vault toilet or one that has a water that flushes through it, like in Confluencia, um, various base to camp camp. But we won't have anything to 
leave there. There's a system when we're on the upper mountain. So those three camps on the upper mountain, then we have a system where we use a, so the, the tents that we'll be using on the mountain are the North Face VE 25 tents. When those get really worn out and trashed, we cut out the bottom of them. Um, so we have a, it's a three person tent, just the dome of it with the floor cut out. Um, and then that's our privacy space in order to use a blue bag. Um, in this case, it's not a blue bag, probably a black bag. <laughs> um, but then we'll have a blue bag type system up there that will then deposit into a larger trash bag, which then porters will then take down the mountain for us. Um, so we'll have a sheltered area and then um, a deposit bag, and then it'll be taken down. Mm -hmm. And let's say someone needs to use the bathroom uh, mid day. What happens in that situation? Yeah, so we will, we will have a supply for the expedition of emergency uh, blue bags to take with us when we're between camps as well, yeah. Uh, one more question for Rachel. Uh, do you have a sense on the Bacchus Valley route about what percentage of people opt for porters? Less on the Vacas and a lot more on the normal route normally uh, is what we see. The, the Vacas route, sometimes um, the, the differences between the camps, the longer distances, farther distances. So the cost is a bit more for porters, definitely on the Vacas route. So you tend to see more people opt for porters on the normal route and less on the Vacas route, but percentages really varies trip to trip. Another question for Rachel. What type of health checks are done on the mountain? Ah, we didn't talk about that at all. It'd be a good question, yeah. So at uh, Confluencia, Plaza de Mulas, and um, Plaza Argentina, those three spots, we have um, teams of Argentinian doctors. They uh, rotate through those camps, and they, it's actually something that, that they really enjoy doing. It's fun for them to come to the mountains for a while, but they will rotate through. And so every time we pass through one of those camps, um, so when we get to Confluencia, when we arrive, the day after we arrive there, we'll go and we'll check in with them. And what they will do is uh, with every member of the team, they will take their um, pulse oximetry. They will, at the higher camps, they'll listen to lungs, make sure there's no lung sounds of um, sort of developing pulmonary edema there. They will just check your, your um, pulse, kind of a little general overview to say, hey, this person looks like they're acclimating well, great. Um, continue on up the mountain. So that happens at Confluencia, happens at Plaza Mulas, and happens at Plaza Argentina. And we also work with the doctors to always try and schedule those kind of as close to when we are going to be leaving those camps as possible. So you're as acclimated as possible before you go and chat with the doctors. Uh, and definitely all the way through the expedition, we, we spend a lot of time talking about how to help your body acclimate appropriately too. But those are the points where we will check in with the Argentinian doctors. And then they're also a resource for us as well as we have questions about things going on too, which is nice. Okay, hey, that was a great question. A um, couple more left. Uh, Rachel, another one for you. Um, what goes into the packs on various legs of the trek? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, definitely I always have a list <laughs> at our gear checks when we, when we starting from Mendoza, I usually give people a list of exactly what we want in our packs for trekking. And then as we go further and further up the mountain, we'll add in more layers and glove layers, jacket layers and glove layers usually. Um, but we will start out, we will have water for the day, snacks or lunch for the day, whatever layers we need for the temperatures or where we're gonna be at on the mountain that day, what we're expecting weather wise. Um, and then bits and pieces like, um, we'll usually have our headlamp in there as an emergency piece of kit, our small first aid uh, supplies for any blisters that might come up through the day, just the kind of the stuff that we need to move our way through the day. And your guide will definitely give you a list every day of, you know, here's what we should have in our pack for this part of the trek or this part of the trek. Yeah, a specific list. Okay, um, we have one final question. Uh, this relates to travel, I don't know, you two will know the answers. Um, I've heard it may be better to travel through Santiago versus Buenos Aires. Do you have any preferences? <laughs> uh, I can say personally that the airport in Santiago is pretty slick. <laughs> if, if you had a choice, um, I, I would choose that one over Buenos Aires, <laughs> personal experience wise. I, I would agree. I, I think it probably doesn't matter too much, but the uh, Santiago is a lot closer. It's a it's a short flight and it's pretty easy. Um, so I've I've found that to be pretty 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 easy. So I would go with that. But 
Next. Next. Um, great. Uh, okay, we'll just do one more question, uh, and then we'll need to wrap it up. Uh, what are the typical, so back to cooking, what are the typical arrangements for cooking? Does the team help? Are there designated roles? Like, who is responsible for making sure the team gets fed? <laughs> So when we're at our camps, Confluencia, Plaza Argentina, Plaza Mules, those areas will have a team of people that are not your guides uh, cooking for us. And they cook really incredible meals for the spot we're at. We're always surprised. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, when we're on the upper mountain, so those, those three upper mountain camps on either side, then your guides, your guide team is responsible for cooking and they will fully take charge of cooking the meals. Um, you won't be responsible for cooking the meals at all. Yeah. Nice. Uh, great. Well, thank ev thank everyone for thank ev thank to all who tuned in to the webinar um, and were engaged and asked so many helpful questions in the Q and A box to help uh, better educate us all about what to expect on Aconcagua. If for some reason your question did not get answered, do not fear. Um, you can always reach out to the Alpine Ascent office. If you have any gear questions, you can either give us a call or email. Um, their email address is gear at alpineascent.com. If you have questions related to travel, like do these flights work? Am I arriving at the right time? You want someone to take a look at your flight? Um, those can be handled by either Gordon, Jano, or Chris. If you've ever interacted with them, you can reach both of them at climb at alpineascents.com. And you can expect to hear from your lead guide about a month before your expedition uh, with some final reminders, uh, the opportunity to also talk with other people on your team. Um, so you can expect that coming up. And I think that about does it. Rachel, thank you so much for taking the time to do this webinar. Uh, your PowerPoint was amazing. I learned a few things. And Sierra, thank you as well for taking time out of your busy schedule to enlighten us all about here. This webinar has been recorded and it will be live on our Alpine Sense blog probably in about a week if you want to review any of the materials. All right, well, thanks so much. We will wrap it up then. Farewell. <laughs>